Hi, I'm Bill Hillgrove, radio voice of the Pittsburgh Steelers and the Pitt Panthers. You want to know by now. You want to know by now. You want to know by now. You want to know. You want to know. You want to know. Chuckleheads, I am Carlo Guadagnino. This is Dingo Talk. My guest this week, voice of the Pittsburgh Steelers and Pitt Panthers, Bill Hillgrove. Bill, thank you very much for joining us today. My pleasure. Happy to be here. So I want to jump right in. So you're born and raised in Pittsburgh, as I could tell by your 1958 graduation at Central. Where did you grow up? In the Garfield section of Pittsburgh, which is near East Liberty, or as we Pittsburghers say, Sliberty. And why the choice from when you graduated from Central, why the choice for Duquesne? Were there other schools on your map or is that where you wanted to go? No, basically it was Duquesne, and because they had an FM station on the air, and I kind of knew what I wanted to do, uh, wasn't specifically sports, but I kind of had that in the back of my head. And, uh, you know, the, the fact that they had an on-air situation and a radio TV uh, degree, uh, you know, it was a natural. And uh, I never really looked anywhere else. So did you get experience immediately going on to campus as a freshman, or did it take you a while to get into? No, it, it, it was uh, almost immediate. Uh, I did some uh, Duquesne basketball, and they also had a, a, a line to South Stadium, which is across the Monongahela River, and we did a little bit of high school football, but uh, they turned us loose pretty much right away. Uh, some other schools, you have to wait till you're a junior, before anybody even knows you're on campus. But in this case, uh, I was very fortunate. Um, so when you graduate in 1962 with your, your bachelor's in journalism and radio and TV, what is the first job out of, out of college? Well, it was the same job I had since I was a sophomore. Uh, I was part-time at WKJF. Uh, that's in the days when FM, very few people had sets. And it was a good place to cut my teeth. You know, your mistakes aren't heard by that many people. <laughs> and frankly, we played elevator music. And, uh, but you know, I had two things. Number one, I got my experience. And the only way you can do uh, what we do is to do it. I mean, mm -hmm. that's the only way to learn. Not much in the classroom that is gonna help you except the English language, which I think is your bag of tools. <laughs> and uh, you know, the, the other thing was that, uh, uh, you know, I was very, very content to be able to help uh, my parents with that first year of tuition. So, uh, you know, it, it all worked out pretty well. So after, how many years are you are you with your first job before you move, make the jump to being with the, the Pitt Panthers and uh, well, it's WTAE, but it was also Hearst Broadcasting and, and all that. When does that all come into play? Okay, it was three years part-time. And okay. then when I graduated, they offered me a full-time position at KJF. And I did everything. I did news. Uh, you know, I, I sat between the tables and read the labels, playing record, and uh, did some promotion. And, uh, you know, it was it was a good experience in that regard. And that was five years of uh, uh, full time. Mm -hmm. And then in 1967, Channel 4, uh, on my fourth audition, my first color audition, uh, they decided to hire me. And that was April 1st, 1967. And uh, that was a big opportunity. Uh, to move, uh, you know, basically to a major player in the market. And uh, it was uh, a move that, uh, frankly, gave me a, a flying start. And uh, interestingly, I was in that job, a booth announcer, when they had such a thing. Uh, sat in the booth and waited for the, the movie to be over. Mm -hmm. And read a couple of, uh, you know, department store tags. And, uh, and basically, uh, it was boring. And so, uh, summer of 67... Uh, when I got hired in spring, the summer, uh, the CFO called me and said, you know, we're going to uh, change the format of the radio station, which is located downstairs of TV. And uh, we're going to go to a middle of the road and they need a nighttime disc jockey and you can go heavy on scores. And I said, well, that's a step towards sports. Let me see if I can uh, at least put a partial sports ad on. And, um, you know, it was a great opportunity. So when does the when do the Pitt Panthers come calling for as and, and you've been with them since, correct? Right. This was in 1969. So it's two years later. OK, I'm doing my time disc jockey show and heavy on scores. And uh, the boss came to me and said, have you done play by play? And I said, well, when I was a student at Duquesne, 
I did uh, a lot of uh, basketball and a little bit of high school football. He said, great. He said, we're going to get the games away from another station, but Pitt wants full-time basketball coverage, which hadn't been on the air since Don Hennon days, and that was in the late 50s. And uh, because Ed Conway was going to do the play-by-play for football, he couldn't do basketball because he was the main anchor on television for 6 and 11 p.m. So uh, they said, you'll do the basketball and you'll help Ed in the booth for football. And that's where I got my introduction to Pitt. And, of course, I had to take my Duquesne sweater off, and <laughs> some of the people on the bluff wanted to have me excommunicated. I'm only <laughs> kidding. But, you know, it, it, uh, it, it was just a great opportunity. And I, I said when I got the job, Uh, and maintained also uh, my disc jockey thing that I'd do this play-by-play as long as I didn't feel a wall. Well, I'm pretty fortunate I haven't felt the wall yet. I haven't felt the wall yet, and hopefully it keeps going. Yeah, Um, well, I'll keep going as long as the guy upstairs approves and as long as it's fun. And as you know, it's more fun when teams win, but still it's, it's fun. And as long as it's that, I'll keep doing it. I'm like a golf pro. What do I retire to? <laughs> yeah, what are you supposed to? Are you supposed to go golfing after? Like when you're done, do you just ride off into the sunset and golf every day? Is that the next move? No, you know what I often said as I looked ahead, uh, distantly ahead, I said my ideal uh, uh, retirement would be an eight o'clock tea time and a 1230 post time. <laughs> uh, I do like the races. I do like the horses. I haven't had much time to deal with it. But from afar, I've always enjoyed uh, watching the racing channel and listening to people talk about how they bet horses. And I don't know where I got that because nobody in my family uh, had that disease until I came along. <laughs> so um, very long career so far with the Pitt Panthers is where that's where we are right now. Uh, what are some of your favorite moments that you've been a part of, been able to call? Uh Football would be obviously the Tony Dorsett touchdown against Navy that allowed him to break Archie Griffin's record. And uh, it was a, uh, it was the perfect venue, you know, the Naval Academy. Mm-hmm. And they only fire that cannon for the mids. But in that instance, that, you know, their people recognizing the historic moment, uh, they fired the cannon when he hit the end zone. And then his parents came out of the stands and they walked around the outside of the fo- of the field at Navy Marine Corps Stadium, and the entire brigade of mids doffed their caps. And uh, it's a moment that uh, it's it, I'll, I'll never ever uh, forget because uh, I had trouble talking. I became emotional. I, I had tears running down my cheeks, and I kind of looked over at Johnny Sauer, my color man at the time, and uh, I figured he's going to help me. And I see tears running down his cheeks. And it strikes you like a lightning bolt that you're looking at a -a once-in-a-lifetime athlete, which certainly Dorsett was. That's what we called him Dorsett. We called him Dorsett then. (laughs) Not Tony Dorsett now, as they call him. He didn't didn't become French until he got to Dallas. (laughs) So, and are there any basketball stories that stick out for you? Yeah, a couple. Um, I, um, one, uh, Clyde Vaughn hit a corner shot against I think Cincinnati and we beat them at the buzzer uh, that was emotional but nothing of the uh, impact of winning the first Big East uh, basketball tournament crown uh, we beat Connecticut and we finally broke through because there was a joke back when we joined the Big East that the Pitt New York City ticket was actually one basketball ticket and four Broadway uh, tickets you know, and, and because we'd always get beat in the first round. And then finally, when Ben Howland came along, um, we surprised Notre Dame, we surprised Louisville, and all of a sudden we're playing Boston College in the championship game. And I remember uh, Dick Grote, our color analyst, and myself having to go to Macy's to get an extra dress shirt because we didn't have enough dress shirts to get through uh, the whole week in Manhattan. We didn't expect to be there. So, and, and you brought up, you bring up Dick Grote. What was it like covering games with him? Uh, it was a, a lifetime opportunity. Uh, interestingly, and, you know, we, toward the end of uh, Dick's tenure, we were ACC. Mm-hmm. People below the Mason-Dixon line generally don't know that he played shortstop. And people above the Mason-Dixon line 
don't know how great a basketball player he was. <laughs> and uh, it was just a joy to travel with him. New York City, uh, he had a love-hate relationship with Yankee fans because he beat them twice in seven-game World Series, once as a Cardinal, once as a Bucko. And, uh, you know, they, they loved the guy. And so it was always an open door no, no matter where we went. Uh, you know, when you get on a first-name basis with Manhattan bartenders, I think you've uh, accomplished something that should be on everybody's bucket list. <laughs> so, so it was never a dull moment when Dick was around. No, and, and he knew the game, taught me a lot about the game, uh, would always flash me the defenses that he saw. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he just he had that cerebral approach, not only to, to basketball, but to uh, baseball. But interestingly, uh, all the success he had in baseball, he claims he had to work at it. Uh, basketball came naturally to him. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't realize the, 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 the size of that uh, impact that he had on the sport until – uh, we were up at, uh, we played the old Eastern eight. We played Rhode Island on a Tuesday and then we played UMass on a Thursday. So here, here we are with the Wednesday off in new England. And I said, what are we going to do? He said, I'll call my old coach. I said, who's your old coach? He said, Red Arbach was my freshman coach at Duke. And he called red. And the next thing I know we're in Boston, uh, to watch the Celtics and the Utah jazz. And I went to the shoot around and there's Danny Ainge. And there's uh, Robert Parrish and Kevin McHale and Larry Bird and Casey Jones as the coach. And it was unbelievable. I'm like a kid at Christmas. <laughs> when the uh, uh, shoot around was over, I'm walking back through the hallway and here comes Dick out of Red's office with Red in trail. And he said, coach, I want you to meet my partner, Bill Hillgrove. He shook my hand. He said, you know how good he was. I said, well, I only saw him play once, and that was for Fort Belvoir against Duquesne in a charity game at the old Fitzgerald Fieldhouse. And he said, you know how good he was? I said, he was pretty good. Pretty good. I'll tell you how good he was. If he sticks with the big ball instead of that stupid little ball, he said, he's as good as Kuzi. And if you ever quote me publicly, I'll call you a blankety blank liar. <laughs> <laughs> it was Red's mouth to my ears, and that told me, uh, what I think the greatest mind in basketball thought of my partner. Well, and, and we would be remiss if we didn't. Did, were there any sports since you were, you obviously wanted to call sports and be involved around sports. Did you play sports coming up through, through high school? I lived near a ball field, spent morning till night at Fort Pitt field and Garfield on top of the hill. And uh, I became a pretty good baseball player. I was an outfielder. I had pretty good speed. Uh, but I, I always, as I looked from the top of Fort Pitt hill, as twilight would set in, I could see the light standards at Forbes Field for a night game. And I said to myself, I'd like to be part of that sometime, thinking that I wanted to play Major League Baseball. Well, I wasn't the best kid in my neighborhood, let alone, you know, good enough to make the Major Leagues. Uh, but I got there, uh, let's say, by the uh, global route. Uh, I did it uh, an end run uh, to get to the big time. And it was it's been kind of a fortunate run. Um. Now you you brought up Ben Holland and, and and there were some great teams that came through during his time at Pitt. There were some great teams with Jamie Dixon. Uh, what's been the problem since Jamie left? Why has there been a struggle to bring? It, it seems there's a struggle not to bring the talent in and then to bring them together. Well, I, I do think uh, that um, I you know I, I'm not going to talk about anybody negatively but when Jeff Capel was hired I really thought they hit a grand slam and I still think mm -hmm. he's a great coach he spent seven years uh, at the elbow of the greatest coach in the history of the game and four years playing for him and uh, I just said that's a good thing to bring that brand of basketball to this campus but this was before the portal uh, this was before COVID and I really think both things have negatively impacted uh, Jeff Capel's, you know, thoughts of bringing Pitt back to the big time. And I just think it's uh, it's a setback, and I think they have to overcome it. And this year, your two best three-point shooters, one because of injury and one because of suspension, aren't around. And now we go to war with uh, teams that have brought in graduate transfers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the whole evenness of the college game right now is – dramatic and i'm sure the powers that be like that but i don't like the portal because it encourages 
young people to quit. Uh, if a freshman only gets five minutes a game, he looks down the road where the grass might appear to be greener and says, well, I can get 10 minutes a game in that program. And, and I don't think real life is like that. Uh, you know, there's, there's no, uh, no greener grass in real life. You have to play the hand that's dealt you. And I think uh, we're teaching young kids to quit. But that having been said, there's nothing you can do about it. Okay, you can benefit from the transfer portal, mm -hmm. but I think it's negatively impacted the game because of the newness of every team. And this is just about every team we've faced this year has had transfers. And, uh, you know, it's, it, it, it takes teams a while to get things together. Now, by the time the tournament rolls around, these teams will have, you know, uh, under control what they need to do uh, to be great teams. But right now, this time of the year, it's like catch as catch can. Yeah. And it's interesting you 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 feel that way about the portal. I've talked to a couple of different people that also it's a great it was a great idea, but the idea on paper did not transfer to how it's affecting programs in the sense, like you said, somebody doesn't like the, what their time is or what their role on the team is this year. They look down the road and say, oh, well, I can go here and they'll play me. Well, what happens then? You get down the road. They don't play you. You're going to do it. Again, and you just can keep doing it. It's it's a very you're, it's a slippery slope, I guess we would say. I think that's a good way to put it. Now, um, you know, I, I it, it it gives kids an opportunity uh, to play more. In other words, if you're only getting five minutes a game, you can play more down the road. Okay, you know, you're only 18, 19 once in your life, and and I don't blame them for doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think there should be tighter reins on the process. But unfortunately. Uh, the threat of litigation scares uh, all, uh, you know, all people in charge of the college game and they don't want to spend their time in court. And so it's easier just to let the kid go. And then you factor in the, you know, last year, everybody got a free pass because of COVID. Mm -hmm. So uh, a fifth year senior can become a sixth year senior, which prior to that was unheard of. Yeah. Uh, the, pit foot, the pit football team has a couple of seven year kids uh, because of mitigating injury circumstances uh, earlier in their careers. So, it's, it's crazy, but, hey, you deal with it. When we jump into pit football, I got two quick questions, and then we're going to send it to a break. Uh, first, any uh, insight on Kenny Pickett? Are we, is he playing in the bowl game? Is he? At first, he said he was going to. That was right after the uh, great win over Wake Forest to win the ACC title. Uh, but I think since then, uh, whoever his agent is going to be and uh, maybe some other people closer to him have said, uh, you know, you're rolling big dice if you play in that game. So if he decides to opt out, I have to understand, you know, I, and I can't fault him one bit because you know what he did by staying? He put a couple million dollars in his pocket and there's no sense in giving it up uh, to the uh, uh, haphazard situation of one injury. So, yeah. you know, if he decides not to stay and, 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 and also, uh, you know, this game is anticlimactic for the Panthers. They won the game they had to win yep. to win that championship. They're first. Uh, and, uh, you know, so uh, uh, if that's the way it plays out, hey, I get to spend uh, part of a New Year's week in a warm weather climate <laughs> and in a dome for the game. So I don't care personally. Of course, <laughs> you know, I'm being selfish. And then my last question, and it also has to do with Kenny Pickett. It has to do with the Wake Forest game. The... I don't, I want to, I think it's the Kenny Pickett rule now, the fake slide. What, great decision because it, it results in six. What do you think of the move though? I never questioned it when he did it. And apparently the TV guys did and said it's unsportsmanlike where you go to offer yourself up and then all of a sudden keep running. And I see, I see the weakness of that. Mm -hmm. But I, okay, let, let's just say this you're playing football. I think a quarterback out of the pocket is a running back. And so I think the slide rule is stupid anyhow. And so, you know, just eliminate that. And then you don't have to have the Kenny Pickett rule because now you're, you're, you're giving the officials one more thing to decide. Mm -hmm. First of all, where he starts the slide is where the play should end. Now, if he fakes the slide, you got to bring it back a couple. Yeah. I mean, it's, you're putting too much on the officials and uh, goodness knows their plate is full enough as it is. Absolutely. So we've come to that point. We're going to send it to our sponsor, uh, Chambers General Store in Bethany, West Virginia. 
Chambers doesn't have it. You don't need it. And if you've ever come to Bethany and not driven through, not driven through Main Street and stopped at Chambers, then I don't know how you made it here because there's there's one thing on Main Street. It's Chambers General Store. It's been here since 1917. Um, they have everything: uh, breakfast sandwiches, biscuits and gravy. There's soups every day. There's a lunch special. Uh, you can get a deli sandwich made from pretty much every deli meat that he has. Um, and while you're doing that, you can buy tools and anything you can need for a college dorm, fixing up your house. It is a true blue general store uh, located here in Bethany, West Virginia. Uh, I am Carla Guadagnino. This is Dingo Talk, my guest, voice of the Pitt Panthers and Pittsburgh Steelers, Bill Hillgrove, and we will be right back. While you're in Bethany, make sure you stop in the store for a daily lunch special, breakfast sandwiches all day, try out the biscuits and gravy, guaranteed it'll fill you up, and also look for our new burnt orange chambers, if we don't have it, you don't need it t-shirts, and our psychedelic green third edition Bethany mushroom capital of the world t-shirts. Now back to you, Dingo. What's going on, Chuckleheads? I am Carla Guadagnino. This is Dingo Talk. My guest, the voice of the Pitt Panthers and Pittsburgh Steelers, Bill Hillgrove. Uh, we talked about how Bill made it into, into the industry, and we ended with a lot of the Pitt side of his broadcasting. Now we're going to move into the Steelers side of his broadcasting. So when do you, I believe 1994 is when you joined with the Pittsburgh Steelers? Yes, and uh, as it turned out, I did not apply for the job because Jack Fleming was a friend. He was the voice of the Mountaineers. We had crossed paths many times. We had played golf. Uh, you know, we had gone to racetracks together. And uh, well, I never gave it a thought uh, when he retired. And then all of a sudden, I get a call from the sales manager of the radio station saying, uh, the more Mr. Rooney hears your tape, the more he likes it. And I said, what tape? I didn't submit a tape. Well, they're using your tape. Uh, of pit games to uh, compare all the other tapes coming in from around the country. And uh, I said, oh my gosh, I might be a candidate for a job I never applied for. <laughs> and then sure enough, uh, a couple of weeks later, uh, a good friend of mine, Tom Donahue, who was the general manager of the Steelers then, or director of player personnel, uh, called me and said, we had a meeting last night, things are looking good. And I went, oh my goodness. <laughs> and then sure enough, we had a meeting with the Rooney family it was Dan, it was uh, uh, Artie II, and Joe Gordon, uh, Jimmy Carter, who managed our radio station, and myself. And uh, we talked, and I remember one of the questions from uh, Art II, who is now the president of the club. Uh, he said, do you have the energy to do both? And I said, yes, I was born with a lot of energy. And I thought, my goodness gracious, uh, I, get, I guess I have to give up my TV career and uh, become a full-time play-by-play guy, uh, which certainly, uh, you know, it, it was fortuitous. In the meantime, about two days after that meeting, I get a call from Jimmy Carter, my boss, and he said, I got some good news and some bad news. What's the good news? I said, uh, he said, uh, you're going to be the voice of the Pittsburgh Steelers. I said, what's the bad news? He said, you're going to take one hell of a pay cut because I was making TV wages then, and now to go back to radio, uh, to me, it was a, a slight step back and the opportunity to take big steps forward, and it's worked out very well. So <clears throat> that 94 season is a pretty big deal. The 95 season is a pretty big deal. What, is, what are some of your early memories? Because it's you and Myron for, for his, the rest of his time, correct? Right, and uh, we were together for 11 years. But people don't remember that in 1983, when Johnny Sauer uh, developed some medical problems, he couldn't go. And we found out about three weeks before the season that he was a no-go. And they came to cope and they said, uh, I know you're doing uh, a lot during the week with your talk show and the commentaries for television and radio, uh, but we want you to double up with Hillgrove for a year at Pitt. And uh, he said, uh, I don't know if I want to do that. And the boss said, well, your contract is coming up. <laughs> and then Cope said, I'm all ears. I'm all ears. And uh, we did a year together. So that was kind of like a premonition, a preview, you know, being able to develop uh, chemistry with Myron uh, in a, 
you know, in a live broadcast situation. Mm -hmm. And it, it served me well in 94, 95. 94, we were solo. I believe in 95, Merle Hodge came into the booth. And uh, it, we, he only lasted one or two seasons. And then he, you know, he got hired by ESPN and went big time on us. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's the way things went. And I remember the 94 season, uh, Pitt, Pittsburgh was a 10 point favorite over San Diego uh, in the first playoff game. And uh, they call it the Alfred Pupunu game because he made a big conversion of a third or fourth down that kept the San Diego drive alive and caused the Steelers to lose the game. 95 worked out better because the Steelers went to the Super Bowl. And I'll never forget Cope and I taking a cab to Sun Devil Stadium. We get out of the cab and this voice behind us from another car yells, they'll let anybody in here. And we turn around, look back, and it was Chuck Knoll. So, uh, the 95 was a much better year for the Pittsburgh Steelers and their fans. So, through 95, and then the late 90s isn't as good for the Steelers. What's that like as a broadcaster when they're – not that it was bad. It was just not – it wasn't a going to an AFC championship. It wasn't going to the Super Bowl. What, what changed those next couple of years before we get to – Cordell and Tommy and then, and then Ben being yeah. the guy that he is. I, I think, you know, all teams go through it, but fortunately or unfortunately, Steelers fans are spoiled. Yes. Uh, a bad, a bad season is eight and eight, not making the playoffs. Uh, they never dream of four and 12. Mm -mm. And, uh, you hear Mike Tomlin say the standard is the standard. And, and that certainly is. And uh, as many warts as they've shown this year, uh, this club still is in the playoff hunt. Yes, they are. Six, six, and one. They shouldn't be, but they're still in it. And But that speaks probably more to the evenness of the AFC and uh, the superior uh, nature of the NFC this year. Uh, you know, you can say that there are three teams, definitely Super Bowl candidates from the uh, national side, but from the American side, it's anybody's ball game. Well, and so let's go through a typical day. First, I want to go through one of the the uh, the post game or not post game the Tuesday press conference. What is a Tuesday press conference day like for you? Well, I you know having to split the two. Monday is the Pitt news conference day, and Tuesday is the Steeler uh, news conference day. So I try to keep it that way. Make Monday a Pitt prep day. Mm -hmm. Get the stats together you know, get the charts ready for next week. And then Tuesday, uh, a Steelers day. And, uh, you know, it, it, it seems to have worked out pretty well because, you know, you have to separate the two. I remember my first fear was 94, uh, my first year with the Steelers. Well, Pitt's running back wore 29. His name was Curtis Martin. And uh, Steelers running back Barry Foster was 29. I said, oh, Billy, don't get the two of them confused. <laughs> and fortunately, that, that never did occur. But uh, you know, I, I keep them separate, and and I think that's good uh, because I, you know, I, I basically work for both uh, programs. And fortunately for me, at one time, uh, they considered themselves rivals, and and so it was unthinkable that one guy could do both. But when uh, you know the uh, Heinz Field mm -hmm. uh, was developed and and built, uh, and UPMC got involved. Uh, it brought the two teams together because they were going to share a stadium. And, and I think the thinking was then, well, if we share a stadium, why can't we share an announcer? Uh, and so that all changed. And I was lucky enough to be there when it all happened. When you bring up that change, um, what's the biggest difference for you on a game day from three rivers to being in Heinz? Like, is there any difference in the in noise? Is there any difference in the way that you you see the field or anything, or is it sim very yeah, similar? Very similar. I don't think it's as loud because of the shape of uh, Three River Stadium, that hat box, mm -hmm. and the noise seemed to stay and reverberate. I think at Heinz there's more open, especially the end toward the river, even though the jumbotron is there. But and that's been built up, and it's helped the kickers because the winds aren't as uh, unpredictable as they used to be. Uh, but uh, there, there, there wasn't a whole lot of difference. And I, I've always said, hey, it's a 100-yard field. It's 53 and change wide. Uh, it's four, four downs, and, and, and it's, you know, it's basically the same game. Okay, mm -hmm. a lot of rule differences, and the hash marks are different, but 
it's still the same game, you know, and I, I, and when it becomes an important game, either a playoff or a Super Bowl, I tell myself the same thing. And I use the movie Hoosiers as an example. You remember when Gene Hackman was a coach of that little town that, uh, uh, what, what did they call it? Was it uh, Hickory? Hickory. The Hickory. It was, really, it was really Milan High School because, you know, the state of Indiana had an open tournament where all mm -hmm. classes uh, tried to get the state title. And, and, uh, and he takes his team to the, uh, to the big venue, uh, that Henkel Fieldhouse, where they're going to play the state championship. And he measures the, the lane and he measures the, the foul line up oh, 15 feet. He measures the best 10 feet. This is the same as our basket back at Milan or Hickory in the movie. In the movie, and, yes. Yeah, and, and so I've taken that lesson. It's the same game. And so don't make it any more important than it really is. And you realize, you know, the backstory is largely important. But I still have to call a first down. I still have to call a reception. I still have to call a fumble. And it's basically the same game. Now, just to get back to my original question, which with following your day to day. So a Monday and a Tuesday are set. What does the rest of the week look like, especially given that you're this week that we're recording this, you're coming off of a short week. You had a game Sunday, you had a game Thursday. Uh, what is that week like, I guess, because that's the abnormal, right? Yeah, and you have to look ahead. Now, uh, when we started, we didn't have the internet as we know it today. Mm -hmm. uh, we had to wait for the release to show up in snail mail. Uh, those days are long gone, thank goodness. And so I can go ahead on the internet and even, uh, I can even tell you for this week, I have Michigan State's uh, two deep and mm -hmm. roster. I have the Kansas City uh, uh, two deep and roster. And, uh, uh, you know, I, the, the Titans, I've finished uh, their charts except for the stats. And so you, you can work ahead thanks to the magic of the internet. And so a short week, you, you see it coming and you can get ready for it. Whereas we used to have to wait for the snail mail and, you know, come a holiday week like Thanksgiving or Christmas and the mails aren't quite as dependable. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a whole different world, but it's an easier world in that regard. So a couple more questions, Steeler related. I got, I have three calls that I want to ask you about. Okay. One is Antonio or uh, Santonio in the back of the end zone against Arizona. One is Jerome Bettis's last game. And one is against Baltimore, where Antonio catches the, the pinned ball up against his helmet. Um, I want to start with the Santonio catch. What is that similar to the Tony Dorsett um, reaction? Like, you're, you have to call it, but it's also like, whoa, this just happened. Like, no, no question. And, and at Raymond James, our booth was opposite that on the other side of the field, and it was down to my left. And so my view of that play, even with binoculars, uh, you know, I was obscured. Mm -hmm. Ed Conway, who was my mentor and the guy who called the pit games when I first started in this business, uh, taught me something that's invaluable. Watch the official. And I watched that official, and I, I can't remember who it was. If you'd give me the name, I'd say, yeah, that's him. But I watched that official straddling the out-of-bounds marker, looking at Santonio and his feet and looking for the catch. And when I saw his hands hit his hips, I said, here comes a touchdown signal. And that's when I called touchdown. And uh, I, I, I am so thankful that I had that help and that tip uh, to be able to call it properly. That was a great moment. Uh, ben put that team on his shoulders and marched him down the field. Santonio should have caught the one in the left side of the end zone on the previous play. Yes, he should have. Give Ben credit. He went right back to the well, you know, get back on the horse and ride it. And uh, that was certainly a magical moment. Uh, Bettis's last game, you mean the one at Heinz Field or the one uh, at, in Detroit? Well, I was going to ask you which you preferred, the Heinz, because his last game at Heinz Field, is that the meeting Brian Erlacher at the goal line? Yeah, yeah, that that in that. So those you know, are two in, pretty big calls there, because the Super yeah, Bowl. Yeah, yeah, oh, without question, because he took Erlacher for a ride, and you know I remember Jerry Olsowski, who's now the Steelers' inside linebacker coach. He played it, played for the Steelers, and he said, "Billy, the toughest running backs to tackle are the guys with the big butts, because you can't get your arms around them." 
And that was Bettis' secret. All right. <laughs> uh, he didn't fumble. Uh, he was fast for a man his size and certainly uh, was a tough guy. And, and I remember after that game, I had promised a, an autographed football to somebody for a Christmas present, and it was right near Christmas. And so I hid it in my bag, and we're not supposed to approach the Steelers. That's, that's a rule. Don't approach them for autographs. So here I am back in the corner near his locker, and I'm screening the rest of the room like facing him and hiding the fact that I got a football. And I pulled it out of the bag, and I said, and I had the pen, and I said, would. And as soon as I said would, he pushed me out of the way, grabbed the ball, and said, you're family. Don't worry about it. And he signed it right in front of everybody. And, you know, that's the kind of a guy the bus was. I mean, it, one of my favorites. Uh, the third one uh, you mentioned was, uh, what was, oh, uh, Antonio Brown? Against the, the the Antonio Brown against Baltimore when he's, yeah. he's still not really he, known at that point. I, I, I remember saying he, that he literally willed himself into the end zone, and he did. It was absolutely uh, a spectacular play and a very heads-up play. Mm -hmm. Because he knew all you have to do is break the plane. And uh, he did. Now, is there a, as your as the Steeler broadcaster from, and we'll go big, your career so far, so from 94 to now, is there a play that stands out to you above all other plays? Yeah. When, when uh, Jim Harbaugh uh, threw that pass into the end zone. Uh, in the 95. Yep, a championship game against the Colts. And again, I was taught by Ed Conway to hold up until you see something and then call it. If you don't see it, don't call it. And I felt so good because I waited mm -hmm. until Merle Hodge was in the booth and Merle saw the official point to the ground and he was the first one that said incomplete. I hadn't said anything. I said, there's a scrum in the end zone and, and then you hear Merle say incomplete and then I called it because I was told that the network announcer and the Indian announcer both called it a touchdown. And if you looked at the replay, it was scary because uh, the receiver was, was it Bailey? Was that his name? I, 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 I know think, that, I know that the bottom angle that we have, you kind of see that it could have been, it, it was, was on his stomach, but the defensive back for the Steelers. And again, you know, the name escapes me, but I'll think of it. Was there a Randy Fuller? I believe that's who it was. Swiped the ball and it fell off his abdomen before he could grab it, and it hit the ground. And that's when that official pointed to the ground. And uh, you know that that to me, that was because I mean you're you're going from going to the Super Bowl or not going to the Super Bowl, uh, one play, and when it hinges on that, you know that's high drama. And then it worked out well for the Steelers and their fans. Lastly, on the Steeler topic. This year, as you said, it's they they have fought tooth and nail. They're they're six six and one right now. They're in a uh, they're still in it as as much as sometimes it's not looked great. What is the biggest takeaway from this team right now as they sit? It has many warts. I think all teams do, uh, and I think one of the warts is tackling. Uh, it's just it, it, this is not the same game that we saw in the nineties. Okay. when teams were allowed to put the pads on more often, especially late in the season. And I think that's affected the game, but it's a level playing field. So everybody has got that same work. Uh, this team, uh, however, defensively, you know, it, this is not Steelers standards. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of reasons for it. And I can't go to injuries because Baltimore has a better record right now. And they probably had more injuries than any team in football uh, and more key injuries. But the Steelers certainly have missed Tyson Alu Alu, uh, no uh, Stefan to it. Uh, so it starts right there. Uh, and uh, on the back end, I think they're okay. Uh, Joe Hayden goes down, and this kid Witherspoon comes out of nowhere and comes up with two big picks against the, uh, 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 the Vikings. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 I think the back end is okay. Uh, they don't have a Mike Hilton now, and he used to blitz from that corner slot, you know, yeah. that slot corner or whatever they call it and, and get to the quarterbacks we don't have that element right now and uh, as a result uh, this defense uh, you can score on it and you can run on it and we've shown the ability to give up the passes too but uh, you know it's this is not the typical Steelers defense that having been said 
this team doesn't fight, I mean doesn't stop fighting. They didn't stop against the Vikings. Uh, when you start at your own four yard line with no timeouts and and with two minutes to go, and you have the ball in their end zone at the end of the game, uh, to me that's a measure of character. Absolutely. And, I uh, and I see it with Ben, and I see it with with the entire team. It's not that they're not trying. It's just that they just haven't had the success that we're used to. That having been said, they're still in it. And and as you said at the beginning of this segment, specifically, Steeler fans are spoiled because a bad season can be eight and eight and not making the playoffs. And there's no mental, like the next year, you're not thinking coming in, well, they could go four and 12 this year or four and 13, I guess it would be this season, but they, that's a beside the point. It's just that it's interesting to see the way the fan base reacts when there is a little bit of adversity. And this season has shown that a little bit. I think the end of last season showed that a little bit. Um, yep, no question about it. I, but I think fans are fans. Uh, I just think the Steelers fans, uh, I think one of, one of the reasons that uh, they're, so, they're so obvious is that uh, the Steelers fans travel better than anybody in the NFL. It's almost uh, like an Alabama or a Notre Dame, you know, and, and, and there's a socioeconomic factor at play. And that's the fact when the steel industry died, uh, we chased a lot of kids out of Pittsburgh to go get jobs around the country. And they're still Steelers fans. And so when this team shows up in Atlanta or uh, L.A. or uh, Florida, it doesn't matter. Uh, the team hotel is like black and gold. <laughs> and, uh, and some stadiums are black and gold. Uh, the Chargers, SoFi was, I'd, I'd say, almost half and half. Uh, not so much with the Vikings, but still, I'd say it was 35 to 40 percent Steelers fans. And, and that's a tribute to the fandom. Um, they're the best. And then the last question I have for you is if you were giving advice to someone who wants to get into broadcasting, there's a college student out there maybe watching, or there's a high school student trying to decide what they want to do. Why this profession? Why, why, what does it, what does it give to you that, that has kept you doing it for so long? Well, what has kept me doing it for so long is I'm allergic to work. And, <laughs> and the easiest way to kill me is to give me a real job. And I would say that to a young person. If you want to do something that where you don't count the days to retirement, uh, this is it. Uh, and also the advice, and this is very serious, uh, that I tell young people, uh, be yourself, number one. Don't try to imitate anybody. Oh, you can learn from the greats, but be yourself and also be versatile. Don't say that I want to be the voice of the Pittsburgh Steelers mm -hmm. because you're setting yourself up for failure. Uh, and like I say, I've been blessed and lucky in that regard. But, uh, you know, let let the gentle winds push your talents toward a goal. And don't say, I want to be this because you set yourself up for not being that. And that's not good. You can't do that to yourself. Well, Bill, I want to say thank you for the last, uh, I guess it would be 30 years of listening to you on the radio. Well, 26 years of listening to you cover Steeler games. Uh, well, you're making me an old man. <laughs> and, and, and I will say this. When I was born, the Dead Sea wasn't even sick. <laughs> I am Carla Guadagnino. This is Dingo Talk. My guest, the voice of the Pitt Panthers and Pittsburgh Steelers, Bill Hillgrove. You can find us on YouTube. It's at Dingo Talk. Instagram at Dingo underscore talk. And Twitter at Dingo Talk. Um, and we, we're here every Thursday at 10 a.m., Chuckleheads. So we'll see you next week. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. I've been dinged. <laughs> <laughs>